so you uh, were a student there, and yes. uh, at some place uh, along the line, you came to San Francisco. When was that, and well, what that were the was circumstances? Quite a bit, that was quite a bit later. Oh, was it? Yes, you see, I went through the medical school, and uh, as I say, the, the third and fourth year medical students would scrub in on some neurosurgical procedures. Mm -hmm. And then uh, upon graduation, I took my surgical internship there and worked on his service. Mm -hmm. But then he went in the military, and uh, so him and I did in 42. And we both came back about the same time, at the end of 1945. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going through his residency. And then took uh, a tour uh, in San Francisco, uh, not knowing whether I'd stay there for a year or forever. And uh, while out there, I was recruited to return to the medical school in mm -hmm. Rochester mm -hmm. and joined Dr. Van Wagner on the neurosurgical service. Was Dr. Nafziger still active when you were at here? Yes, uh, Dr. Nafziger was the one that I uh, applied to. He interviewed me in the early part of 1948. Huh. And uh, so we went out there. And he was great. I'd actually gotten to meet Dr. Van, uh, Dr. Nafziger in, uh, during the military service. I see. And uh, so... Was... Well, I, I knew he'd, he'd been in the service, but I uh, he just Well, he no wasn't idea. actually in the service. I was. In other words, mm -hmm. I was doing uh, duty in the Southern California desert as a medical officer of the group to uh, reinforce Patton in North Africa. I see. But he did so well, we didn't have to... Yeah. <laughs> and so we went sure, into, sure. through Normandy to Europe. Yeah. Well, tell me about Dr. Van Wagenen, his uh, upbringing, his education. Yes, and, uh... Dr. Van Wagenen uh, came up from a farming background in upstate New York, uh, Nunday, New York, born about 1897, and was a good student to the extent that he won a state scholarship to enter uh, Cornell University and from there uh, went was admitted to the uh, uh, Harvard Medical School after a year of, of uh, Cornell Medical School which was that, that time in Ithaca hmm. and he was graduated from uh, Harvard Medical School and had an internship at uh, Memorial Hospital in New York and then at the Peter Bent Brigham where he became enthusiastic about neurological surgery. Hmm. So then he went on and took his training. Uh, yes, the training was very interesting at that time. Apparently they would have an interval of, on the clinical wards with Dr. Cushing and, and uh, find something. In his case, he found uh, neuropathology again at Memorial Hospital. And uh, I have an interesting letter to how they decided things at that time. In 1924, Dr. Cushing wrote to Dr. Van Wagenen, what are your plans? Have you decided on anything? I do not know quite how long Dr. Putnam plans to be here, mm -hmm. but wonder if it would not be a good thing for you to come on now, if you are free, and start work in the laboratory with Bailey, and therefore be on ground for a vacancy when one arises. That was his letter <laughs> to huh. become a resident. Yeah, quite different from the uh, contracts that we have with residents today. Right. Yeah. He, uh, of course, then went on to, uh, after finish his residency with no place to really practice, one just didn't start out in neurosurgery anywhere, like mm -hmm. you know, hospitals weren't prepared. And he had heard about the uh, newly developing medical school at Rochester, New York. So he took off for there and had a residency in general surgery at the Rochester General Hospital. Mm -hmm. And then following that, he took a tour of duty in uh, Munich and Breslau in Germany for research activities which served really as his inspiration for uh, the Van Wagenen Memorial Fellowship many years later. Huh. And then after that, he was appointed to become the uh, neurosurgeon at the newly formed University of Rochester mm -hmm. Medical Center. Mm -hmm. um, well, you trained with Dr. Van Wagenen. Could you uh, sense the Cushing influence uh, in Dr. Van Wagenen? Yes. In fact, uh, it would be impossible to not do that. Uh, early in his uh, career, he kept up a running uh, uh, correspondence with Dr. Cushing. And then uh, when Dr. Cushing uh, retired, he uh, would send some of his former patients to Dr. Van Wagenen. Apparently, they, they started out as uh, not necessarily the best relationship because, as you know, when air studies came in, uh, primarily from Dr. Dandy, mm -hmm. Dr. Cushing did, never did accept them. 
But Dr. Van Wagenen wrote a report very early in his career of the uh, success of localization of brain tumors with use of air studies versus just the neurological examination. And uh, that didn't go over very well with huh, <laughs> Dr. Cushing. Huh. But then, as I say from this correspondence, uh, it's easy to see that uh, Dr. Cushing uh, referred quite a few patients uh, to Dr. Van Wagenen. In fact, he said in, in 1932, I should like to ship down to you all of my old derelicts to patch up in this way, and you may expect to uh, see a good many of them. So that uh, uh, even during my residency, there were still people with chronic uh, fibroblastic tumors around that had been operated on a number of times. And huh. So that he and, uh, and Dr. Cushing had quite a continued relationship. Was Dr. Cushing uh, cutting down on his practice at that particular point? Yeah, he was not only cutting down, but he'd been uh, replaced quite preemptorily. Oh. He set up the age of uh, 60. And I understand he sort of forgot about that when he was informed that Dr. Uh, Cutler would be taking over mm. in September of 1932. Or about that time, he said, whoever started that idea? They said, you did, mm -hmm. Dr. Cushing. This so was at the Peter Brent Brigham. At the Peter Brent yeah. Brigham. It was about that time that uh, Dr. Van Wagenen uh, came up with the idea of starting a brain tumor registry. And it mm. had all the approval uh, with no financial backing. So that the, uh, there was some impetus to get it started. And for all other problems, uh, Dr. Cushing moved to Yale, moved to mm -hmm. the Haven. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, he wrote about the, he um, said, I think the idea originated with you about a brain tumor registry and so forth. And then it, as he got into the uh, Yale University, he said, the Boston people, this is dated October 2, 1934. The Boston people were not wildly enthusiastic about the brain tumor registry and had difficulty in finding a place for it. And, and he indicates that it's moved on to uh, New Haven. And I must say it provided quite a museum of interesting uh, neurosurgical material. When I uh, was studying for my boards in 1951, and among other things, I made a little tour of that. And Louise Eisenhart was still running that. Yeah, right? I did the same thing, and Louise Eisenhart was still there. It was there. a beautiful experience. Yeah. yeah. To, yeah, to, to read uh, Dr. Cushing's operative reports and see his own Diagrams. Uh, diagrams. Yeah. It was really, and look right. at the slides, it was, right. it was exciting. Did uh, Dr. Van Wagenen have an ongoing relationship with uh, Dandy? I, yes, they did. I, it isn't uh, well recorded. I, I do remember, though, that uh, very vividly when I was uh, well along in my uh, surgical residency training, Dr. Van Wagenen would say, well, now, uh, Frank, why don't you take a little tour down to Johns Hopkins and watch Dr. Dandy, and he, mm -hmm. he, uh, he was a great one to, uh, for these tours, which mm. I did very briefly. And um, uh, in fact, he encouraged me to go down to New York and watch Ted Scarf operate for mm. hydrocephalus. And, mm. and who, who were Dr. Van Wagenen's friends? I mean, who well, actually, among the neurosurgeons? Actually, uh, the neurosurgeons at that time, uh, they were coming along at his age group, had one thing in common, getting together and talking. And you may recall in 1920, Dr. Cushing had started the, the Society of Neurological Surgeons, and it was a closed group. So Dr. Uh, Van Wagenen and Dr. Sperling, Tracy Putnam, uh, Eustace Sems, Temple Fay, they all developed this little collegium, hoping to be invited not only to, <laughs> to the Neurosurgical Society meeting, but to someday uh, become members. But nothing happened. I have a letter here of August 18, 1930, in which Dr. Van Wagner writes to Dr. Glenn Sperling. I had a letter from Bailey, that would be Percival Bailey, mm -hmm. after the last neurosurgical meeting. His comment, meaning the senior society, his comment was there was a good deal of discussion about taking in new members. He felt practically certain that I would be taken in at least within the next year for the discussion that took place. But nothing happened. Uh, so as the, developed this more and more uh, critical correspondence among, well, I would say, about uh, 
uh, six or seven of these young neurosurgeons, and they couldn't quite get together uh, as to whether they should actually make the move of a new society, hmm. preferring of alienating uh, Dr. Cushing. And uh, for instance, Dr. Sperling wrote in 1931 uh, to Dr. Van Wagenen, I've just finished a letter to Sems, a copy of which I'm enclosing, and uh, so on and so on and so forth. It was all kind of secretive. Hmm. But then finally, uh, do you want me to continue on with this scenario? Yeah, I'm very interested in that. <laughs> well, it leads up to what people uh, like to talk about the origin of the society. And then in uh, the mid part of 1931, the crisis came when one or two of the uh, inner six or seven couldn't quite get along with joining with one or two of the others. Uh, at, there was one time when Dr. Temple Fay was uh, refrigerating people for mm -hmm. stopping brain tumor growth, if not re uh, completely removing it. And finally, uh, Dr. Van Wagner wrote a letter to Dr. Sperling. I think we ought to get together, uh, the four of us, namely Sperling, Sems, Temple Fay, and Van Wagner. And they met on October 10, 1931, at the Raleigh Hotel in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, at that meeting, they drew up a prospectus and a kind of list of members and uh, set uh, Dr. Van Wagenen on the road to find out if Dr. Cur uh, Cushing would lend his name. Uh, mm. It was interesting, I was back last week in Rochester and talked with Mrs. Van Wagenen and she, she has a vivid memory of this, having driven to Washington, D.C. and then we had to drive to Boston. Huh. And uh, they, they, Dr. Uh, Cushing apparently, rather than being offended, was quite flattered because at that time he was becoming a little bit disillusioned with some of the things mm. that were happening. So he gave this uh, new Harvey Cushing Society his blessing and it did convene uh, in 1932 uh, uh, for its first official meeting. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Van Wagenen started the training program in Rochester. Uh, how did one start a residency program in those days? Well, it was all quite unofficial. There was no American board, and his uh, first training uh, candidates were often people who perhaps couldn't find a job with Dr. Fraser in Philadelphia or with Dr. Cushing. Mm. And there were one of uh, Jean Rossier uh, had been advised to come and train. And I, I believe that Dr. Cushing actually was a referring agency. And even when uh, People like Dr. Hugh Cairns visited this country. He, uh, Cushing suggested he stop by Rochester and so on mm. and so on. So on. Because when uh, Dr. Van Wagenen started up, he had rather a rigid formula for developing a, a, a neurosurgical service, much as he had seen it at uh, uh, the Brigham Hospital in Boston. And unfortunately, years later, that somewhat led to his uh, disillusionment because he never did really accomplish the full type of academic neurosurgical service that he wanted. Well, what was it like being a resident of Dr. Van Wagenen? Well, it was a, a very uh, challenging job. It was, uh, I might say, it was an unpopular service in some respects because you <laughs> You did work pretty uh, hard, and it was demanding, but uh, I rather enjoyed it. Uh, I must say that when I returned from the service in 1945, my goal really was to complete my training in general surgery. And uh, I was, quote, rotated, unquote, into the neurosurgical service as an assistant resident to fill in, and for some reason or other, I seemed to hit it off fairly well with uh, Dr. Van Wagenen, and I rather enjoyed the, the work. Some might have mm. called it some degree of slavery, but it was, to me it was very pleasant. Hmm. How did Dr. Van Wagenen uh, rate as a politician in those days trying to obtain some separation from an autonomy from general surgery? Well, I'm afraid he... he he wasn't uh, really effective. Uh, the chief of surgery then was Dr. John J. Morton, Jr., who was a trainee of the Mass General School. And at that time, that era, the general surgeons uh, 
especially those in charge, felt they could do just about any kind of surgery, and that, mm. but uh, some were delegated to do most of it. But it is true that Dr. Morton had spent some time with Dr. Cushing, and he and he and I used to talk a lot about certain operations he'd helped Dr. Cushing with, and so forth. Mm. So that he never uh, cared much for the idea of a, an entirely, certainly not a department of neurosurgery, mm -hmm. and. Um, Dr. Van Wagner, of course, wanted his, although we did actually have our own operating room, he wanted more of a fixed arrangement and more laboratory space, uh, a whole uh, research unit and so forth. Hmm. In fact, he became so upset in not obtaining that, in 1952, he took a sabbatical and went around uh, the country, in fact, traveled Europe to, to gain momentum for uh, uh, certifying what the good academic neurosurgical services had. Hmm. And he submitted uh, a summary report uh, after his return, but uh, it was not accepted. Hmm. What, uh, what do you think were Van Wagenen's uh, major contributions to neurosurgery? Well, I think... Well, let's just take, take the field of education. Yes, I think his major contributions uh, probably were in uh, his papers, his... Uh, uh, research activity, he had a much more productive uh, career than one would realize. For instance, he started out early, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier this afternoon, that he was in inspired to bring everybody up to date on what uh, details existed rather than some of the major endpoints. Uh, he published one paper showing that somewhere around 12 percent of people with grossly increased intracranial pressure didn't have choked discs and that sort of thing. Hmm. And he uh, embarked on a project with Dr. Jonathan Rhodes on showing that the meningiomas actually arose from a fibroblastic cell and had mm -hmm. elastic tissue. He also became interested in the um, approach to control of epilepsy. And probably one of his uh, accomplishments for which he is best known is when he published his paper in, uh, I believe, 1940, uh, entitled Surgical Division of the Corpus Callosum uh, for Control of Spread of an Epileptic Attack. Mm. In other words, he had the idea that if an leptogenic focus started uh, a seizure process to prevent it from crossing the midline so that it could become a full grand mal that a section of the mm. Corpus Callosum might do that. But he finally... Uh, decided that it really wasn't effective. And uh, I remember I attended the meeting of the Harvey Cushing Society in 1949, where Dr. Van Wagner went and verbally retracted any big drive for section. And his uh, activity was uh, typified then because he had a slide showing the frontispiece of the textbook on physiology by Starling, a 19th century text. And uh, Dr. Van Wagner said, now in this writing, Dr. Starling states, section of the corpus callosum will not spread, will not prevent the spread of an epileptic seizure. And he said, how he knew that, I shall never know. Huh. <laughs> Walked off the huh. stage. <laughs> huh. Huh. But since then, people have, there have been uh, quite a few operations performed in that direction mm -hmm. uh, recently. Yeah, we, so we do them in our place. It may, it, yeah. it may come back. I think one of his other contributions, too, was uh, involved in something we don't see anymore in the so-called field of psychosurgery. He was impressed that certain uh, frontal lobe leucotomies would do much to uh, reverse compulsive obsessions, changing uh, depressed states, mm -hmm. and so forth, taking the place of electric shock. But that is uh, pretty much handled with medication uh, at the present. How would you uh, characterize Dr. Van Wagenen as a surgeon? I, I think of the two extremes of uh, Cushing, who was uh, uh, meticulous, slow. Uh, uh, everything had to be was it was strictly Halsteadian uh, techniques, and Walter Dandy, who was uh, brilliant, a little impetuous, uh, very rapid, uh, very fast. Uh, what did, uh, what was, it, how would you characterize Dr. Van Wagenen? Well, I think Dr. Van Wagenen, uh, on the score of one to 10, I think he was about in the middle. Mm. Uh, he was never accused of coagulating capillaries and that sort of thing. Uh, 
but he did he was very meticulous but he would he would take quite a time we'll say in uh, opening up uh, some craniotomy cases but other times it'd be extremely rapid and his uh, work was very well directed uh, I've often thought that when he made a move it was for a specific purpose mm -hmm. and he I think the one thing that he at least inculcated in me that the training of a neurosurgeon relates to being able to approach surgically any part of the uh, intracranial area. Uh, he was quite uh, a pioneer in going through the corpus callosum for extracting a pineal tumor. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I think that's how he developed the idea of sectioning the corpus callosum uh, for surgery mm -hmm. or epilepsy. And his, his approach to the posterior fossa for sectioning the trigeminal nerve or for various uh, posterior fossa, I know that uh, I learned a great deal about cerebellar surgery, so to speak, opening up the posterior fossa from him, which proved to be uh, one point because uh, in years thereafter, I used to get all of these so-called difficult posterior fossa cases coming in. Mm -hmm. And I think that his training proved to be very helpful. Mm. He also was a good spine surgeon. He, uh, as I say, he covered the whole uh, fabric of, of neurological surgery. Hmm. Uh, other than the corpus uh, callosum section, is there a particular procedure that you would say uh, is associated with Dr. Van Wagenen? I, I wouldn't say there's any particular procedure because he had so many little things. It, it's interesting how it uh, carried over in his retirement days when he played golf. He had more things attached to his golf bag that would clean huh. up the ball or repair a divot. But he was a guy, friends, got a compliment from Dr. Cushing that following a craniotomy, he'd put a little silver clip on the dura. And then if, there were, if the patient were not doing well, there's a question of a epidural hematoma, they'd just take an x-ray. And, hmm. and uh, he had all kinds of uh, uh, spatulas for brain abscess and forceps. And he was... He was an instrument maker, among other things. Huh. Tell me uh, about uh, Dr. Van Wagenen as a uh, husband, father, uh, and how he fit into the social fabric of Rochester. Well, actually, he met uh, his wife, Abigail, and they were married in 1930. She'd been a school teacher, and he said, took her out of the schoolroom and put her in his home, so to speak. And they, they were a very closely... Uh, dedicated, devoted couple. They did not have any children. Hmm. And uh, Dr. Van Wagen led a, I would say, a regimented neurosurgical life, so they had relatively little time for any social uh, events and didn't really enter uh, the, the social life of the community of Rochester. He didn't go to concerts and he didn't do this and he didn't do that. He was a, a severely dedicated neurosurgeon. Hmm. Hmm. Did he have any hobbies? He had practically no hobbies, and that uh, was interesting to me because when he was about to retire, he called me in and he said, Frank, you get uh, quite a entertainment on this game of golf, don't you? And of course, I really wasn't playing that much, but what I did play, I enjoyed. And he said, I've been thinking of taking that up. He said, now, he used to always hit a baseball left-handed. Uh, of course, I write right-handed. Which golf clubs do you think I ought to buy? I was nonplussed, and he said, I, what I think I'll do is buy a set of left-handed woods and a set of right-handed woods and put up a driving range in my backyard. Now, I'm only <laughs> telling you this because that's how meticulous he was. Oh, and and he did set up a big canvas backdrop, and he also told Abigail's wife, now I'm getting you some clubs because we're going to take up golf. And at his age, then about 58, 59, he took up, and he finally decided he would hit the ball right-handed, so he bought the right-handed irons. <laughs> and he and Dr. Kenneth McKenzie had quite a lot of time. Uh, mm. Dr. McKenzie would come from Toronto, or sometimes Van would go to uh, Toronto to play. And, and I used to get invited once in a while to join them. And uh, mm. it, uh, it was a brand new thing for him to relax in that fashion. Mm. Why did he retire so early? Well, as I say, yeah, he, he was, was, as I understand it, he was only 58. That's right. He was 58. He was in prime health. He was uh, completely frustrated uh, of not being able to do neurosurgery. He felt it, it should do. I suppose you could call it a little bit of a burned-out 
syndrome, if you would wish, but I don't think it was that as much as just his uh, lack of flexibility in getting along with the forces developing there in the, hmm. in the world of comp competitive uh, surgical enterprises and at a time when the medical center was not about to set up, quote, a demagogue, that sort of thing. And uh, it was within the idea that the university is a general area of orientation, a community of scholars, and so on, so on, and so forth. And it, um, it posed a real problem when he did retire, and I thought I would probably resign, and I was asked to stay on, and then they interviewed a number of people, and then when I was given the appointment in 1954, it, it was a, an uphill fight to, see, Dr. Van Wyn had closed the residency, and uh, it was uh, a battle in a way, but we did manage to get uh, laboratory space and um, uh, some degree of uh, our own operating room and, and a budget and that sort of thing and uh, residency approval. What was uh, Dr. Van Wagenen's uh, experience in the laboratory? His experience, actual experience, was more in neuropathology. When he was over in um, his European tour, he was engulfed in uh, stains, the metallic stains, and he uh, developed some fine uh, slides of various types of pathology, both uh, neoplastic and non-neoplastic, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. had quite a file and, uh, available. But uh, he didn't get into the uh, ordinary, uh, didn't get into electromyography or anything of that sort. And it was more uh, of an idea of getting others involved. He did uh, develop a nice area from one of the things we started, well, Bill German uh, brought some animals and so forth. We developed, I'd been interested in this uh, cine myelography where we made a movie mm -hmm. of myelograms as a teaching. And so Dr. Bill German came with his staff and used our laboratory facilities and rentgenographic uh, developments. And so Van was very much interested to sponsor anybody, but as an actual laboratory uh, person, uh, uh, he did not become involved. Mm -hmm. Did he travel a great deal? Uh, he traveled relatively infrequently, uh, except to meetings. And uh, but in his later years, when he after he was retired, he traveled. He uh, spent his uh, winters in uh, Mexico near Guadalajara, and he made, as I say, a, a European tour, checking on what neurosurgery should have. And he, he was very much interested in. Uh, showing people at the University of Rochester that we just didn't have the academic neurosurgical service that he felt was mm -hmm. in order. Mm -hmm. Did he uh, just walk away totally from neurosurgery when he retired? <clears throat> he uh, did walk away, except he had a running correspondence with me. He was always interested in hearing things that we were doing. And of course, we had a lot of time socially when he would be in the Rochester area during uh, off winter months. Uh, we, uh, he was vitally interested in some of the things that we thought were new and so forth. Mm -hmm. And he did take an interest in setting up a, uh, a research fellowship, which has become known as the Van Wagenen Research Fellowship. And uh, he had the most, uh, first of all, he has put in his will a specific sum of money, which the interest would uh, provide what was an adequate stipend at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Van Wagenen has contributed to increasing the stipend gradually to its current level. And so that I think this was the project that occupied him more in his mm. uh, last year or two than any other thing. And he spelled it all out in his uh, will. Did he ever get to actually see a Van Wagenen fellow? No, no. You see, he died in 1961. And uh, then in, by 1962, uh, we had the... Uh, the process pretty well, but it it took me personally almost four years to have it accepted by the uh, then the Cushing Society. Mm -hmm. So uh, finally, as I say, 25 years ago, we did, and Dr. Richard Berglin was the first uh, professor, really? uh, who, oh. for, or the first Van Wagenen Fellow. And that and was in what year? That would be in uh, 1967. So as I say, it took us four years. Henry Schwartz was the president at the time, 
who was willing to uh, make a commitment in that regard because you must remember that was a novel thing for any group to take the responsibility of, of uh, this type of ward annually and how are you going to do it here. And so I wrote and re rewrote and did this with conferences and conferences, but each time uh, that the board would meet, there'd be some one other little thing we should do. <laughs> so it, but when Henry Schwartz was there, he had been in Rochester on a tour uh, for the purpose of advising, setting up the new neurological service, which was going to be a separate department. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, it had ample time for me to explain to Henry verbally that, you know, we weren't nefarious people. There was nothing we were trying to do particularly to inflate mm -hmm. anything other than to uh, provide an avenue for because the idea was that these fellows would be ones interested in academic pursuit. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really to embellish Dr. Van Wagen. Well, uh, how would you uh, characterize the success or lack of it of the uh, Van Wagen and Fellowship? How would you change it? And what do you think the future is? Well, I wouldn't try to predict the future, but right. I do think that we've followed a very narrow line uh, because in, through the years, uh, there have been all kinds of ideas of changing it. But Dr. Van Wagen and his will put the strict criteria of having it a tour to a foreign country made by any candidate from the, this hemisphere, uh, it didn't have to be in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, who would be interested, would have completed his residency training and would, have, uh, would be interested in uh, academic appointment. But to the, and the stipend was limited with a $2,500 travel allowance. But so many times, uh, new suggestions would be that, oh, uh, why can't the candidate go to some center in the United States? Or why can't mm -hmm. you do this? But we've actually been very flexible. Uh, we've had Canadian fellows. We've had female, uh, this, this year is our third female mm. Wagner fellow. And, uh, as far as the uh, uh, furtherance of it, all I can tell you is that other foundations that have sponsored fellows of this type have written asking how we, because I don't know of another fellowship quite like this. The Markle Foundation Fellowship has gone and, mm -hmm. and there are not many that are left quite like this. So that uh, I hope it will continue. And Mrs. Van Wagen and her will, I've just gone over that with her, has uh, written this all out with some broader application potentials. In other words, it uh, will be directed primarily to postgraduate study, and if, if someone should wish to go to Japan or some mm -hmm. other, other, it could be accomplished. But we hope that on the basis of the fellows who were certainly, we, uh, last evening we had a dinner, uh, a silver anniversary, celebrating mm -hmm. the, the uh, Ben Wagner Fellowship. And this, this uh, group, we meet every year, by the way, at l luncheon at this uh, annual meeting. And the uh, past fellows have developed a collegium of their own and quite a bit of loyalty. So I think that's going to be the background. It's going to be the heart of the future. Huh. Um. Going back again to uh, Dr. Van Wagen and himself, how, uh, how do you think of him just in terms of his, uh, uh, his dealing with uh, people at his level and the people uh, beneath him, just in terms of, uh, was he, obviously he was very severe on himself. Was, were his expectations equally high of you as a resident or the secretary or... His, his, expect, his ex, uh, expectations, and I might say even demands, were, were uh, at a very high level. Mm -hmm. And he did not uh, tolerate procrastination. He didn't tolerate uh, poor technique. He didn't uh, tolerate substitution. Uh, he would like nurses assisting him to be ones that were trained. He liked instruments to be laid out by protocol, everything. Uh, to be done. I think it uh, impresses me that uh, Dr. Richard Light has fo uh, forwarded through Dr. Joe McDonald and I've received copies of the meeting uh, proceedings that Dr. McWagan had subsequent to the uh, Harvey Cushing Society meeting in Rochester in 1941. 
it's really amazing how he had things spelled out. Uh, he uh, had uh, a technique for having everything run on clockwork. And uh, with formality, for instance, on the Friday, of course, there were only 38 members, and they had 10 guests and a number of wives, but on that Friday evening, the bus took them from the medical center area out to his farm where he lived in uh, Rush, New York. And they had refreshments. I don't know whether there were any alcohol or not, but it was something. And then the bus took the men back to the Genesee Valley Club where they had their annual dinner, a stag dinner, and the women had their dinner with Abigail Van Wagner. And, and huh. this sort of thing, of course, wouldn't prevail today. Sure. But uh, I would say that uh, Dr. Van Wagner uh, did not tolerate any uh, second rate. I think he probably picked up a lot of that from Dr. Harvey Cushing, I would imagine so. Did uh, Dr. Van Wagenen ever have someone uh, working with him, an associate or a partner? Not, not other than uh, myself. And um, it was interesting that he ran a one-man service from 1928 until, uh, I would say, about 1940, 41. And then Dr. Ristein, uh, who had been a resident, did hang around for a bit until he found a place. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, at one time, Dr. Richard Light came to Rochester to possibly join Dr. Van Wagenen, but uh, he then found an area elsewhere. So that when, uh, and then Dr. Jack French had been doing some neurosurgery there during the war year, uh, World War II. But then he went uh, for neuropathology training in 1946 and uh, then found a job at the UCLA, mm -hmm. the Long Beach Veterans. So that when I finished, uh, when, they, when I was recruited to go back there in 1941, I was really the only one that, that was in uh, an actual uh, shared practice. Yeah. We, How many residents did Dr. Van Wagenen train? Well, that's a little hard to find, but not many over over a period of years. I would say about a dozen, mm -hmm. and they're scattered. Some from Europe, some from, uh, and the ones he did train were extremely uh, loyal, and uh, have done well for themselves. He, I must say, he, uh, there are some years where he had some strong residents, then then went back into general surgery, and became chairman of the department and so forth. Uh, I know that that. Uh, would fit for Dr. Jack French. He rotated through Dr. Van Wagenen's service as a resident and then went on to become uh, in an academic status and primarily the head of the Center for Brain Research at mm -hmm. the UCLA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, uh, did he have uh, close ties with the Canadian neurosurgeons? You mentioned Dr. McKenzie. Yes, yes, he did. He had very uh, uh, inestimable uh, res respect for Dr. Penfield, Wilder Penfield, Dr. Bill Cohn, mm -hmm. and of course, Dr. Kenneth G. McKenzie, which, as I said, kept me on the road a little bit because I was invited and more or less inclined, if you will, to, uh, during my residency, to visit uh, Dr. Penfield, Dr. Cohn, and then spend a few days uh, watching Dr. K. G. McKenzie extract uh, acoustic neuroma, mm -hmm. and that's so that, uh, yes, the, um, there was that affiliation. He was a great admirer of Frank Turnbull, too. Hmm. What was uh, going on uh, at the Mayo Clinic during the time that uh, Dr. Van Wagen was active? Well, the Mayo Clinic certainly has developed a uh, fine uh, neurosurgical service. Uh, probably the uh, so-called early giants had just preceded uh, Dr. Van Wagen's era. And this would be Dr. Craig? Well, no. Uh, it'd be uh, prior to him. Um, uh, let's see, Dr. Sachs was in St. Louis. And uh, I'm just trying to think now who was at the Mayo Clinic, but before Dr. Craig. Wink Craig came in after him. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, I, th I think of him as being there. Yes, early. he was. And he, as a matter of fact, Adson. Uh, Adson. Hmm? Adson. Yeah, Adson. Yeah, yeah. Adson. And uh, as I say, the. Uh, and Francis Grant at Philadelphia and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, they were leaders who um, were developing, and this is what frustrated Dr. Van Wagen, because they were developing uh, specialty setups that uh, did not fit the pattern of the University of Rochester at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, there's been a lot of change made, 
But I think that uh, as you look at the uh, formation, each university uh, seems to have uh, formulated its own pattern. Uh, the University of Rochester came, uh, developed a medical center through the uh, result of the Flexner report. Yeah, but it was, it was a relatively new school. It was a brand new school, yes. When I started there in 1936 as a freshman, uh, the building, the main building, was still a little bit unfinished. Huh. And uh, it started taking the uh, early class, the first class in 1924, but they didn't need a neurosurgeon until about 1928 when Dr. Mm -hmm. Wagner was appointed. Mm -hmm. That's when the hospital was finished. You see, they started the preclinical classes much the same way UCLA did mm -hmm. prior to the development of the clinical hospital. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, the, the, the pillars, the various uh, heads of the departments were giants of medicine, Dr. Corner in anatomy and Dr. Bloor in biochemistry, uh, Dr. Uh, Fenn, physiology, who was a great man in muscle physiology mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And what did Dr. Van Wagenen think about your uh, comment about your exposure in San Francisco? Well, he was, uh, he was actually, you see, well, at that time when I f was about to finish my uh, residency training in, in uh, neurosurgery at the University of Rochester, nobody said very much about, well, Frank, we're looking for you to stay <laughs> and this sort of thing. And having seen the situation in San Francisco, I thought, and I had suggested him, I'd like to apply for a job that was opening up with Dr. Nassiger. So he wrote a letter in my behalf, and uh, later, a year or two later, Dr. Nassiger wrote me that letter. He thought it was rather unique, which is kind of typical of huh. Dr. Van Wagner. But uh, he was in favor of because he didn't see any great uh, opportunities developing there at Rochester. So, my wife and I moved our two children, uh, infants, to San Francisco to spend the rest of our lives there. And um, then within uh, a year, Dr. French decided to go to UCLA, and the, the medical school wanted a second man. And Dr. Wagner, of course, and I had a very close relationship. So it was a, a tough way to move your furniture out and then back. Huh. <laughs> yeah. We came back, and we're, we were very happy then. Huh. Um, what constituted adequate training in those days, Frank? Uh, well, your, the adequate training friends. was three years of, of clinical training, and mm -hmm. uh, the main reason I uh, wanted to... My appointment at the University of California was so low that they don't even have it anymore. <laughs> I was known as a clinical assistant. I wasn't actually a resident, and I uh, focused mainly on neuropathology. I worked in the outpatient department, but I had a marvelous time with Dr. Malamud, Nathan oh, Malamud, sure, and, sure. uh, and Ed Bouldry, was a great neuropathologist. I'm sure you remember that. Oh, of course. So I, uh, and I used to go over to Knox Finley's uh, brain cutting sessions in, at the Presbyterian Hospital. So it was a very uh, fruitful time for me in terms of learning. Hmm. But I didn't actually work on patients to any extent. Mm -hmm. uh, what has Mrs. Van Wagenen done since, uh, Dr. Van Wagenen died in what year? 1961. Uh-huh. What, what has she done with, uh, with herself? Well, she's sensing. carried on remarkably well, and we've kept up a close friendship with her. Uh, I still return to the University of Rochester uh, Medical Center a couple times a year, two or three times, and keep up an active uh, relationship there, and I always see Mrs. Van Wagenen. And up to a couple of years ago, we'd perhaps have dinner. But she is settled very nicely in uh, an apartment with a beautiful view, high-rise apartment. She has round-the-clock assistant. She's not a nurse, but a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. companion. And uh, as I say, I was just back there uh, last week, and she's a marvel. She's mm -hmm. up to date, and she talks about Dr. Van Wagenen and so forth, and things uh, almost as if he were still alive. Huh. Uh, before we finish, um, when someone asks the question, as I'm just about to, what uh, you probably knew Dr. Van Wagenen better than any other single individual other than Mrs. Van Wagenen, certainly in a professional sense. Right. What would you like for people to remember about Dr. Van Wagenen? I mean, just uh, this, uh, if, you, if you could uh, project your own feelings about him and have others appreciate what you yeah. appreciated about I him. I think probably it would be an impossible goal because he was not the kind of person that very many people got to know very well at all. Mm -hmm. He didn't really have close friends. It's true that 
he and I developed almost a father-son relationship, but uh, how you can uh, you know, proceed to uh, pass that on is hard to say. It's, uh, I, I think the only thing that I would hope that people would look up a bit, uh, oh, this uh, correspondence, by the way, that he had about all the Cushing uh, origin, I've located, finally. we sent it to the Yale University Library, their oh, okay. archives, and just a few weeks ago, I, I located it. It was put in a box in a shelf. As when the Harvey Cushing Library was fragmented, that was put in storage with other things. And that is going to be uh, moved, I hope, to the archives unit of our uh, national office in Chicago. Uh -huh. So that will be helpful for people uh, to get to know a little bit about Dr. Van Wagner. And, his, and then there will be some other correspondence. And I, I think that. Uh, as they say, the bad that men do lives after them, but the good is mm -hmm. interior to their bones, according to Shakespeare. But uh, I think that uh, there'll be more. There will be more and more uh, digging up of some of the early material. Mm -hmm. Well, he was the first president of our organization, yeah. and uh, you know, when I grew up in neurosurgery, Van Wagen was a legend. Yeah. And I guess putting the putting the question in a somewhat different way, I. Uh, came into neurosurgery in the 50s right. uh, when Dr. Van Wagen was still living, although I never met him. The only one of, the, of his uh, contemporaries that I ever met was Francis Grant. And this, yes. he was far beyond his, his prime uh, physically and intellectually at that time, unfortunately. Uh, but Dr. Van Wagen was one of the great men. Why do you think I would, uh, as just an aspiring young neurosurgical resident, uh, why would I think of Dr. Van Wagen as being someone really outstanding? I think possibly, I, I'm not uh, too sure of this, but I think possibly you might have had some exposure to something he said or that he wrote, and this had a lingering impression on you mm -hmm. because he was a very impressive person. He didn't say all that much, but what he said, people remembered, and mm -hmm. he maintained a almost a statuesque posture. He didn't, uh, there's never any significant humor, although he did have a lot of sort of puckish humor about him. Mm. And I could give you much anecdotal material that uh, people want to hear every so often. But he, um, he ordinarily, as I say, spoke from authority, if not w of his own, and he uh, was highly respected by all of his colleagues. Yeah, that was so probably it. That that was Might have been it. it. Yeah. Uh, because I, I trained with a man who had great respect for his, uh, uh, for his uh, seniors. This was Dean Eccles, of course. And, uh, uh, and perhaps Dr. Van Wagenen was friendly with, uh, with Kahn. Yes, he was very familiar with uh, Eddie Kahn and Dean. In fact, he thought so much of Dean Eccles. That was another place that I had to make a tour to down to oh, New really? Orleans. Yes. Uh -huh. And Dr. Eccles was so pleased. He entertained, uh, took my wife and I out to dinner, and, and uh, so that this is a social relationship they enjoyed. Mm -hmm. But hey, it, you're you're exactly right. I bet I got this. I, I could not remember, but I bet I got it from from uh, from Dr. Eccles. Dr. Eccles had some dear close friends. Most of them were in the South. Yeah, you know, Francis Murphy and uh, Frank Mayfield, right. and uh, but you know Henry Schwartz was in that crowd. And, used to and John Raff and. Eustace Sims was there, but he was not in this uh, uh, fishing, uh, uh, fishing travel. group, yeah, tra travel club, yeah. that, uh, duck hunting club that, uh, that Dr. Eccles uh, was in. Well, uh, Dr. Van Wagen's name will, you know, I hope will be forever emblazoned uh, in neurosurgery through the fellowship, which has been a tr tremendous thing, and it's... Uh, done a lot for neurosurgery, had done a lot for the Van Wagen and Fellows. I think the fact that he was elected uh, as the first president of this uh, organization, beginning as the Harvey Cushing Society, because when you think back, just the four real founders, uh, Sperling, Sems, Fay, and Van Wagen, uh, you must remember that Dr. Glenn Sperling was a very outstanding uh, person. And uh, when they met and got together this list of about 20 names, there are some strong people. And uh, I think it was a tribute to Dr. Van that he was the one that they elected and sure. found to persist, in, at least right. in my thinking. Sure. 
Well, it's, it's been a most enjoyable interview. Thank you very much. Yes.